Hey guys, subscribe for daily content. And if you're shopping for gear, make sure you check out the description for the newest items at some of the very best online retailers. There's also links for some of the items that I personally recommend. Thanks. What's going on YouTube? Metal Complex here. And today I've got a special custom knife overview and presentation to share with you guys. Uh, this is a custom knife sent to me, of course, by my good buddy, Scott. That's Sierra underscore bound on Instagram. I'll put his uh, his Instagram up on screen. But this is a special custom knife created by South African custom knife maker Herakas Lomaris. And I am certain that I am mispronouncing his name, so I'm so sorry. Uh, what a beautiful knife. This is the HB21 Buffalo. Wow. Now, this is very clearly and very obviously a collector tier item. I know that that's very obvious to most of you, but it is not obvious to everybody, and that's okay. For a lot of people, this might be the first time they've ever seen anything like this. It might be the first time that they are being made aware that uh, people collect pocket knives and that pocket knives get very, very expensive. Um, the gloves are not on because this is a delicate item. Uh, quite the opposite. In fact, this is an extremely utilitarian object that is very durable and can absolutely be carried and used, but it is you know, the type of item that is most often collected. It's purchased by a small, a very small percentage of the knife world population. Uh, this percentage of people is interested in specifically collecting things like this. Collector tier, ultra, super high end, handmade custom pieces made with exotic materials. So if this is your first time, welcome. <laughs> this world has been around for a very, very long time. Uh, I don't like to review stuff like this. I like to do presentations. It doesn't really make sense because this is a, an extremely expensive object. Um, and it's also custom made. So it's, it's really legitimately only made for one person. In fact, the handle material is uh, Chad Nichols Kenobi tie, which Scott uh, handed to uh, Mr. Herkes Blommers at a knife show. He handed him a big piece of it and said, would you make uh, scales out of this? And apparently they went ahead and did this. So um, I think the question that so often enters the minds of people who are just unaware of this stuff is who would ever, um, and you know, from certain perspectives, I guess that question makes sense, but you have to understand the reality of it is stuff like this in this case is literally legitimately made for exactly one person. Um, so that's, that's the kind of item that we're looking at today. Uh, and we're just going to kind of go over it. We're going to take a, uh, kind of take a, a close look at everything and just enjoy it for what it is. Thank you so much to Scott for allowing me to share this with everybody. Thank you to my patrons for supporting me. And please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. I started to explain that the gloves are not on because the knife is delicate or anything. Um, and the end of that, the second half of that is the gloves are on so that I don't put fingerprints on these super high polished finishes and surfaces on this knife because a lot of you are probably watching this in 4K and you don't want ugly fingerprints all over the thing that you're trying to look at. So I'm trying to keep my fingerprints off of this knife. Um, the the problem is, you know, the, the glove kind of gets caught in the liner lock every now and then, but wow, that action. Let me show you guys that again. Good Lord, that is ridiculously smooth. South African custom knife makers, I've handled a lot of um, a lot of different things, and uh, it's the the one consistency that I, I mention this every single time. They are so unbelievably well made and so just absurdly consistent, and I think it's because so many of these guys uh, and gals share these secrets. There's it's whenever I hear South African a uh, South African custom knife maker, I, I think. It's going to be amazing, and it's going to feel like a lot of other makers work in the best way possible. I mean, uh, it's no secret that the South African Custom Knife Makers Guild, they kind of, they have their secrets, they keep their secrets, and they share them with other, you know, knife makers that are trying to learn. And that's why we get such amazing consistency. The other cool thing is, now I'm not going to comment specifically on pricing here, because obviously when you're looking at a custom piece, the pricing is going to be specific to what you want. Right. Um, but uh, the other cool thing is when you compare to like, let's say something like this was made in the United States. In, in my experience from talking with these folks, 
The price is usually never anywhere near what it would cost to have something like this made in the United States. Uh, so while I'm not going to sit here and say that, you know, one, two, three thousand dollars is cheap, it is substantially less expensive than having the exact same thing made here or by a lot of other knife makers that I'm somewhat familiar with. Um, so the pricing in that sense for collectors and the actual buying market, I think is actually pretty good. And you'll hear that echoed by other people who have actually sought these things out and bought them. Quality is just absolutely superb. Um, so uh, some quick information about Hercus Blomerus. Uh, Scott is so kind to uh, leave a note here. Uh, Hercus Blomerus was born in 1958 in Uppington, Northern Cape, and grew up in Pretoria. Uh, bought knives with pocket money as a young boy. His interest grew to a knife collection of over 300 knives. Made his first knife in, in 1998, and it was not long before the interest in handcrafted knives developed. Uh, he set up his own workshop, even built some of his own machinery. Um, and I think most importantly here, the, the big note is he started under the mentorship of Andre Thorburn. And that's a name that you guys have probably heard here if you have watched my content for you know a long period of time. Uh, Andre Thor Thorburn definitely creates some of the most incredible high-quality handmade custom folding knives that I have ever handled. Um, so that does not surprise me at all. And it kind of ties into what I was saying there. Um, about, you know, there being knife makers that kind of share secrets and methods and things like that. I wouldn't know. I don't make knives. Uh, I, I would have no idea. I have the easy job of being the um, the guy on YouTube who just handles it and critiques it, or in this case, just showcases it. My job is incredibly easy versus the people who actually make this stuff, and I am no professional in any sense. So I would have no idea. Um, all I can say is it is beautifully uh, well made compared to the things that I normally review. Um, let's see here. Herakas makes a whole line of extraordinary custom folders in various configurations and aesthetics. Most, if not all, sub 3.5 inch gentleman's type folders. That's something that I noticed right away is that this guy's a pretty big uh, compared to the, I, I think I've handled at least one other from him. Um, and I would imagine that's probably why it's called the Buffalo, or the in this case, the HB21 Buffalo. Um, as we were talking about earlier, um, he uh, he says, I met him at the 2023 uh, uh, Blade Show and handed him a billet of Chad Nichols Kenobi tie, which is Scott's favorite exotic material, as he has noted here, and opted for Thor Damasteel. You guys are, I'm sure, familiar with uh, Damasteel. If you're not Damasteel... Is a company that makes very specifically a proprietary blend of, I believe it's RWL34 and PMC27 to create a performance powdered Damascus. So this is not the same as your $25 Amazon likely used saw blade and railroad spike Damascus. I'm joking. I have no idea what they make it out of, but it's nowhere near the same level of quality. But that that PMC27 and RWL uh, combination, um, the end result is a blade that is extremely high performance, very well-rounded, good toughness, good edge retention, good stainless qualities, right? And easy to touch up if you want to. But it's also very easy to polish and get a beautiful finish on, which is why we see it so often in this custom knife maker world. In fact, we see RWL34 as a standalone composition in a lot of custom knives. Um, so you get that performance and you also get the look. The Thor damage still refers to the pattern. The reason we don't see it up here on the flat is because they didn't etch that flat. They etched it down here and that creates a cool look. Even where you're not seeing the pattern, it is still absolutely layered. You can see there the layers do go all the way through. Really, really cool. I think it's a little tricky. And actually, if you turn it just right, you can actually see, I mean, you can see me, right? Face reveal, it's the first time we've ever seen his face. Um, but uh, if you turn it just right, you can actually see the pattern still in there. I think that's tricky to get that polished and then show the etch in very specific parts of the knife and not in others. So that's really cool. Uh, I'm going to link his, um, no, you know, I'm just going to show his Instagram and his website right here so that you guys can check him out if you want to. Highly, highly recommendable. I don't know that Scott has any other specific information here. What you can't see uh, right now is me fumbling off camera with this piece of paper while I'm wearing gloves. Um, but anyways, he says, uh, the end note here was, we kept it simple, letting the material speak. But of course, it includes Herrick's signature handwork spine, um, which is, what he's referring to is this right here. 
Very cool. That's all hand filing to my knowledge, which is really, really nice. I do love blue to purple when it comes to anodizing. I also love the crazy contrast of the Kenobi tie, which is a form of titanium Damascus. Um, Scott can elaborate if he's down in the comment section. I think that would actually be great. Um, but uh, the contrast between this material, the blue to purple liners, and then uh, the most striking contrast is all that color with the polished, um, you know, satin and black of the damascus steel backspacer, and then it goes back to the other side. And we have, of course, a beautiful, what I assume is also Kenobi tie for the pocket clip. Just ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Very bright, very colorful. Obviously, not everybody is into super duper colorful knives. I think a lot of people confuse, like when you hear custom knives, right? You, you, the knee-jerk reaction, the same thing you always hear is that looks like a gas station knife. And then slowly the people who say that figure out that the reason they think that is because they never knew the custom knife world exists. And it's far more common to see knives with color of any type at a gas station. Um, and it, ultimately they figure out that the reason that those knives look like that is because they are imitating the much, much older <laughs> custom knife world, Right. Which is a, just kind of a funny irony, right? And it, it's almost like a beginner's rite of passage to discover this, right? But also, I think a lot of people assume that custom knives exclusively look like this. All custom knives are, you know, uh, the really super colorful layered uh, Timascus and damaged. And the truth is, is no, not at all. Custom knives can take on literally any appearance, any aesthetic. Um, what separates them from the common and basic knife world or the basically the entry-level knife world is the fact that they are um, usually handmade, whether it's fully or partially. Uh, they're also using exotic materials and the overall quality is it's night and day. It's not There's no comparison, right? Not at all. Um, that's not to say that, uh, that people, you know, who are interested in pocket knives absolutely have to end up in a, in a position where they're buying knives like this. It's just a, it, it's something that exists. It's something that has existed for a long time. And there's a lot of confusion surrounding it. Um, and I don't know, a, a lot of people might not know, but the part of the motivation for me starting this channel was just letting people know, Hey, this part of the knife world exists. And I remember exploring it and discovering it. Discovering it first, then exploring it, obviously, and being like, what? What the heck? Is it people pay that much for a pocket? It's mind-blowing, right? But it was, it, it dawned on me how few people know that this world exists, and that's what makes it so interesting. Love or hate the aesthetic of some custom knives. Love or hate the idea that, that pocket knives, simple tools, can cost as much as they do. It exists. It's here. been here for a long time, and it'll continue to be. Let's go ahead and... Uh, now, obviously not a typical video, right? Before we've even measured it, we're 12 minutes in. Uh, the overall length of this particular one, this is going to vary because, again, these are handmade, so you're not going to always get it exactly the same. Um, we're looking at 8 inches, 3.5 inch blade, and 3 points. It's a little over 3 and an eighth. You might actually, it's pretty specific. You might actually, that might be his target. Sizing. We're just going to do a couple of size comparisons here just so you guys get the idea. Um, I, I, I don't think we need to do the whole thing. So up against the 8010, the Benchmade Group Chillinger, in this case, the Ritter Hogue. You can see Ritter Hogue. You can see here it's, it's roughly in this general size range. I think probably the Ontario Rat might be a good size comparison. A lot of people say, why don't you compare custom knives to custom knives? Well, that's pretty much useless to the vast majority of people because... They won't own those custom knives. Right? People say, why don't you compare this knife with other knives that are exactly like it? It's best to compare knives with knives that people are generally familiar with so that they can get an idea of size rather than comparing something like this to a bunch of other crazy, unique custom knives. People go, great. I have absolutely no idea how big or small that is because <laughs> I've never handled that knife. So this is why we do size comparisons with the same knives over and over and over again. Um, but there you go. There's the general idea. Um, so this is a liner lock and this is, you know, very common custom knife world again for people who are unfamiliar. Um, I think, uh, the expectation sometimes is that the more exotic the knife is, the more exotic the lock should be. No, usually not. Usually it's just a frame lock or a liner lock, right? The lock itself doesn't have that much to do with the final price tag. 
um, but it's easier to do, right? Not to say that some custom knife makers don't do crazy locks, right? But it's it's easier to do a, a lock that they know is going to work and function if the end user decides to use it, right? It's also when you're hand making a knife, right? Uh, it's easier to do some of these more traditional locking systems and then focus on the details that the customer actually cares about most of the time. In this case, of course, the polishing, the finish work, the materials, things like that. But we have a simple liner lock, which is very easy to actuate. There is no double clutch or anything. And the action is stupidly smooth. And there's a huge difference between smoothness in a knife like this versus, you know, let's say you buy a $250 Wii knife and it's got close to, if not completely and totally drop shot action. It's nice and smooth. It's great. But that smoothness is more like the assistance of gravity versus the internal surfaces being so perfectly polished that the blade falls into the closed position without your senses even really being completely and totally aware of what's happening. And that's just, that's the result of somebody creating something like this by hand. This is actually, I believe, yeah, it can actually be front flipped as well. Um, the detent is really, really nice. The knife can be, even in gloves, can be reverse flicked <laughs> and can also be, of course, forward flicked. Um, the I, I kind of like the studs. Uh, there's a there's a hard 90 degree edge on the outside of the studs there, but um, in gloves, obviously, it doesn't bother me, right? I don't know if it'd bother the end user or not a little bit, but the, the, the size of them and the positioning of them is actually perfect to manipulate the knife. Um, the detent, I would call, sorry, getting stuck in that liner lock there. The detent, that's eh, just kind of more about a medium is about what I'd call it. But the flipping action and thumb stud action feel wonderful. It actually gives the impression that the detent is heavier than it actually is. I'm not sure exactly what's going on there, but it's really nice. Um, these scales are subtly contoured, which is wild. <laughs> If you think about that, <laughs> that's wild that we're looking at a handmade custom knife and we have this beautiful contouring here. The other cool feature that I think is, is neat is the uh, the actual pivot here is a uh, damascus steel as well as uh, uh, alongside the blade, to my knowledge, is also damascus steel. Really beautiful and just like a nice little tiny detail. That's a thing that I like about stuff like this is the little details. When you turn it over and you look at it, uh, the little things like that are just what makes certain knife people just go absolutely nuts. It stops being about performance, right? Anybody who's in this territory, who's buying stuff like this, it's like they, they've, they know what utility, uh, you know, like what defines a good utilitarian cutting object, right? They've experienced that. They've, they've, you know, enjoyed carrying certain tools and enjoying that aspect of the knife hold for, you know, a, a long period of time, probably still have users that they um, enjoy carrying and using, you know, for that reason. Uh, but then there's this other side that, that they, you know, discover after exploring these these higher tiers of the knife world, and they start to find joy in little teeny tiny things like this. Not just the way that certain things look, but why it looks that way, what it's made out of, right? Um, and for some people, probably Scott, his enjoyment, you know, is uh, actually getting the material, sourcing the material, and then taking it to the knife maker at a show and having him build a truly custom piece for him with little tiny details like this. That's just neat, right? Huge fan of that. Um, a standard, you know, if you'd imagine with me here for a moment that we have, let's just pretend for a moment we just have a plain titanium frame and a an M390 blade, right? The profile here is pretty classic and the blade shape kind of, I guess we're going to call this more of a sheep's foot blade. Um, yeah, it would work very, very well for general EDC, right? There's actually lots of things out there that take this general shape. Um, but uh, the blade geometry, oh, wonderfully, beautifully thin down there behind the edge. Nice little, not not so much a, you know, like a drop point tip or like what Spyderco has for their tips, uh, but a tip that would allow, you know, you to kind of dig into material if you needed to. Um, just Really, really nice. I'm sorry. I'm trying to keep all of the little marks and fingerprints and things off of here. The this is something that I you know point out, and that a lot of other people point out when looking at custom knives. For some reason, a lot of custom knife makers uh, want that IKBS logo on the blade, which is referring to the bearings. And I I always find that strange that you would want that on there. I can understand the maker's logo. But why referring, you know, having to like let people know that it's IKBS, 
I think you should just do away with that. It's just my personal opinion because there's so much here aesthetically to enjoy. It just it really kind of takes away from. Should I be dramatic and say it takes away from the immersion? <laughs> I think I will. Look at this material. Scott, I can understand why this is like your favorite handle material. I mean, this is just stunning. The layers and the colors. You can see here the orange and the purple and how the light bends and causes certain areas to almost change. Well, in fact, they do definitely change colors as you turn, have the light bent around those certain areas. You can see the magenta going to the orange and so uh, back and forth, the blues to purples, etc. And then these white layers that kind of stay, not white, just super, super light blue, they kind of keep that same color. And it's really cool to watch the other cools bend and change around them. Um, no lanyard hole or anything like that. Not that we would need it or care about it. Most people probably wouldn't. Um, I do like that the pocket clip kind of has thinner folds. It doesn't look exactly the same as uh, the Timascus scales and allows it to stand out a little bit. And I also like that it's, you know, it's a functional ergonomic shape. The clip is also contoured. It's a little long for my taste, but that's okay. Again, it's not really a review, more of just like talking about the thing itself. Interesting what's happening underneath here. There's a very teeny tiny little bit of pocket clip material that's actually contacting the frame. The The retention is very, very high, but if he had a whole bunch of material flat against the frame, I think it would create unnecessary drag as you put it in and pulled it out of your pocket, hypothetically, if you're going to carry this thing, right? So that's kind of neat. I like this little angle here, and it probably allow. I, I haven't actually put it in my pocket for obvious reasons, but I would imagine that that allows for the material to slip underneath the clip with relative ease while the pocket clip maintains good retention against that material. That would be my guess, right? But what do I know? I haven't actually put it in my pocket. Uh, the depth of the pocket clip, you're looking at about right here. I don't know who that's useful for, but I just want to show it off. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, Scott. I think that the back side of this scale is actually even more beautiful than the front side. I don't, I can't put my finger on exactly why. Some of these areas, um, are actually a little more bronzy or more gold. I think like the front side has more magenta, purple, subtle oranges. The back side has some more orangey bronze on these thicker parts, especially up here. And then like these areas where it gets almost red, which is wild because red is not really on the spectrum for titanium anno. Um, it's really just spectacular. And uh, this, I don't have anything in my collection that's that's the same type of material. And these colors and patterns and things are just so different to me versus what I normally see. So I just, I don't know. I'm just, I'm kind of awestruck, right? It, it really is just a beautiful and spectacular piece. The, um, the stop pin is certainly internal. In fact, yeah, I can see it. It's a bar running this way. It's fixed in position. So that means there's a channel carved out in the blade. So when it's open, the, the blade stops itself against the stop pin. And then same thing in the closed position. It just comes to the back of that channel that's carved out in the blade, right? Just absolutely beautiful. I am jealous of this one. This is my size of knife. I like the shape. I like the look. Um, I like that it has more, like personally, when I look at handmade custom knives, I, I do like the wild and almost unorthodox look, right? This this territory is very ironic in the sense, it's already ironic in the basic sense that you're taking a tool that has such a simple um, concept behind it. A pocket knife folds, unfolds, cuts, and goes back in your pocket. So to take that idea and create that object that cannot necessarily do that job better than knives that cost $50, right? If you pointed that out at the beginning, thanks. Yeah, we all know that. So does everybody who's buying this stuff. That is not, uh, you're not bestowing wisdom on anybody. We, we understand that concept, right? <laughs> but it's ironic in that sense, right? Um, so a lot of knife makers take that and they take that to the extreme and they make wild, completely and totally inconvenient knife designs because the, the whole idea of it needing to be convenient and utilitarian, it really goes out the window. Like we're so far beyond that being the necessity, right? And that's cool. That stuff's fun to look at. Personally, I like the custom knives where the shape and, you know, how it functions and everything like that. 
the whole thing is still, the foundation is still utilitarian. But then they take everything else, right? The blade material, the handle material, the polishes and the little things like the flower. They take that and they, they pump that to the extreme. That's the kind of stuff that I like. So this knife in particular really speaks to me. Uh, and I'm a huge fan. And I can understand why Scott likes this thing so much. Uh, I don't normally get to handle stuff like this. I mean, I know that my channel is known for showcasing this stuff, you know, more often than a lot of other channels. And that's simply because of how many knives I've handled over this just volume. And I'm lucky enough to know somebody like Scott who lets me take a look at wild and crazy custom pieces that hardly anybody knows about, right? There's half a million people subscribed to this YouTube channel, and I can guarantee you that 99% of them have no idea that stuff like this exists. Maybe not 99, 95%, right? I know a lot of you guys came from YouTube shorts, and I know that you guys don't know that this, st <laughs> this stuff is out there. But uh, it's fun, right? Not coming down on anybody. It's just it's fun to learn about this stuff. It's fun to showcase, and I'm very thankful that um, Scott allows me to, to showcase it. Cause I, otherwise, you know, short of buying this stuff for myself, I wouldn't be able to do it. And I, I can't afford to buy these things often enough to, to showcase them to as many people as I really want to. So it's, it's nice that, that Scott allows me to do this. Um, really, really cool. I don't know that there's a whole lot more I can say. I, I can say this as many custom knives as I've handled from as many custom, custom knife makers who, you know, allowed me to look at their stuff or Scott has showcased it. Um, Herakas Blomers makes incredible stuff. And as far as I can tell, his pricing is very fair versus the general competition out there. So if you are uh, in that small percentage of people who's in the market for something like this, I, I yeah, his work is extremely recommendable, guys. Very, very recommendable. Really, really nice stuff. Um, so I, I don't know that there's really a whole lot more I can say. I'm just very proud that I got to take a look at this and share it with you guys. Um, I think that's probably going to be about it today. Um, like I said, Scott's Instagram, well, you guys saw that at the beginning. I will link the Herakas Blomerus website down in the description. You guys can check it out if you want. Please make sure to follow me on Instagram at metal underscore complex. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like. If you'd like to check out my other content, I do, of course, have lots of videos of knives that are either expensive or inexpensive that I do or don't like, so check those out. And if you enjoy all my content, go ahead and click on that Metal Complex logo right there and subscribe because there's definitely more coming. Thanks again for watching, everybody, and have a great day.